stuff, this is about something like sex. And it's not about sex or some sexuality or anything like that. This isn't about inappropriate things or anything like that. So if you came here for some risk mitigation legal seminar on sexual harassment, you're screwed. So, but what this is about, pun intended, is about being sexy. But like, what does that mean? Like, what is sexy in the context of such an HR or of business, right? If it's not sexual or sexuality, then what does that mean? He's on Instagram, if you'd like to follow him. His name is Blue Frenchy Miles. Not kidding. Great dog. But, um, but, and I'm on Instagram too, but this is, I don't know if any of you are tweeting today, uh, I love to tweet, and I'm Ben Brooks at NY, uh, the hashtag for the conference is HR Tech Conf. Um, I think what I loved about these sessions is if you're tweeting in the middle of them, people on this side of the room will be tweeting with others, and then people that had to go home early will get something out of the session as well, so I encourage you, if you'd like to tweet, go ahead and tweet, I won't take it personally if you're on your phone, as long as you're not on your email or candy corn or anything else like that. Um, but, you know, who am I? So I, you know, you see a couple different logos here. Here are some of the companies that I've worked for, taken all these rich products and kind of woven it together in a very, very cool, digestible way for clients to understand. And they were, they were great partners of mine when I was at, at Marsh. And uh, I was previously at Lockheed Martin. I helped design spy planes for the Army and the Navy and, uh, and an enterprise rental car, the largest rental car company in the world. And uh, amongst many other clients, now I coach businesses and individuals to grow destroy barriers to their greatness that get in the way. I work with nonprofits and tech startups and insurance companies and artists and designers and architects and all sorts of different entrepreneurs and firms. I live in New York City. Uh, I get to travel all over the world, but uh, I like to be home. Last year the conference, we ended up with HR Tech the Magazine on the cover in, uh, last December, uh, which was something completely delighted by and totally unexpected. Um, but you know, we won awards with Information Week. Uh, we, we featured in CFO Magazine. So publications that crossed various, you know, CLO Magazine, um, various uh, different industries and audiences and demographics that we really got featured in. So how many of you are from an industry that you personally consider not sexy? Maybe it's tire manufacturing or mining or some, you know, processing. Okay, so we've got about, you know, a third of the people here that have said, you know, that you're in an industry that's not sexy. And I would say that's how I felt about insurance brokerage. Although it's a large industry, it's a percentage of GDP insurance, um, it's not just the most sexy thing out there. So what I've got here is, I'm gonna, I have a hat, and this is a very important hat, because I'm going to have you all put business cards in, and if you have a piece of paper, put your name and, and email address and, and company on there, and put it in there, because we have a few giveaways at the end of this session. Now, uh, Marsha Connor reminded me of a story. My old boss, Lori, who you saw on the previous slide there. So Lori sits on Executive Row, and this is near her office. And you know, she lives on Park Avenue. And she's very elegant, and you know, wears you know custom clothes, and is, is very proper. And uh, one day, I, I gave her a copy of this book called "Working It" by RuPaul. Okay, so this is probably the first time you've ever seen RuPaul in an HR seminar or session, but I told her we're gonna have a little fun. So I gave her this book, she's got a lot of style, she's pretty fabulous, and so, um, and I thought she would kind of like drop it in her purse and take it home. She put it right on the top of that stack in her office and she waited for people to notice, and it was a great, a great kind of conversation starter, and it was all about making HR sexy and what we were up to, um, but this was a, the sort of thing that did that. So I've got a couple copies of that that we're gonna draw uh, from from the, the hat afterwards. And if you happen to be one of those people you think, I don't know if I want to read Ruth Paul's book. I have another great book that you can choose from uh, called Career Warfare, uh, 10 Rules for Building Your Successful Brand in, on the Business Battlefield. It's actually written by the CEO of John Hancock Financial Services. He wrote uh, Brand Warfare and uh, Career Warfare as well. And it's a fantastic book. And so I'll give you a little bit of choice on that. We'll, at the end of it, we'll, uh, we'll do a drawing. And, and, and... But why does sex even matter? Why do I care? Why do I show up today? Why am I here? Why am I not sleeping in my room still or in room service or something like that? Well, you know, when you think about why sexy matters, sexy is in the, it, making something sexy can really accelerate a lot of your business outcomes. And specifically, if you think about the, the likelihood that your initiative actually delivers on its intent, why are you launching HR initiatives? Why are you implementing LMS? Why are you doing a social platform within your firm? Why are you implementing new recruiting technologies? You know, that's typically, you're not doing it because you had extra money sitting around or you needed a hobby or you didn't have enough software programs or logins at your company. You're doing it because there's a particular objective you're trying to achieve within your business or your human capital strategy. And so, if you're, you know, if, it's, if you're implementing a whole new learning program, it's probably because you need to grow and develop your talent 
delivering a business strategy. Well, you know, if you look at things like you know, colleague engagement and morale or attra the attractiveness of your brand to talent and others, the employee value proposition. A lot of times people think about tangible rewards and then some intangible rewards and things like culture, but reputation is a big part of that. When people have pride in their firm, when they have something cool, maybe it's a cool app on their iPhone, or it's something that you know is designed pretty. I mean, it could be a, a really dynamic screensaver that's really you know interesting and almost like you know, artistic or something. It starts it starts a conversation. They can be you know people can be proud to their spouse, to their children, to people they sit next to on the airplane, to their client, etc. And making it sexy, you know, elevates what it's like to work at that company, not just what they do in their work every day. You know, the perceived value of the initiative as well. You know, we tested for our social network internally two questions. We said, do I use the social network, MU, and then how valuable is it? Well, it's interesting, a lot of people that didn't use it found it extremely valuable. Just, <laughs> so that's an option value, right? So that's a perceived value. It's like the benefits you have on your credit card. You know, you've got all these crazy benefits about, you know, death and dismemberment and trip interruption and baggage and car rental and return protection. How many of you have used those benefits? Probably very few. But you feel better about having them, right? And you feel like you get more value out of that credit card when you do that. And so that's part of it as well. You know, and then adoption of programs and systems. You know, I will bet every one of you in here struggles with adoption about what, whether it's HR people using an HR system or it's managers using self-service or it's employees using the time sheet application, et cetera. Whatever it might be, you struggle with adoption and making it sexy can accelerate adoption. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, and the, and the speed of change, I think, is, is a, another one, you know. Um, things don't have to always be a slog. It doesn't have to be a multi-year effort. The problem is, if you have a multi-year plan, how long is your CEO going to be there, or your head of HR, or when are you going to merge, or will your business exist, or will your budget be there, or will you, the staff you have be there, or will you get reorged, or will you have some COE thing, or geography based, or matrix, or what? Like, things are going to change, so you need to get things done in a relatively short period of time, right? You know? Never is your own career discussed. It's always like at the sacrifice of the company, whatever name is on your badge. The one that's like your name that is less important than the brand that you work for, which I think is interesting. You know, being self-interested about your career is very good for your company. They're not mutually exclusive. In fact, the more self-interested you are about kicking butt in your career, the more value you will derive for your company. So you need to think about yourself. And when you think about your career, making something sexy, you know, do you want to say, you know, what's your career narrative? What's your story? What's your, you know, now on LinkedIn, you can embed objects like a portfolio. So you can put a slide share deck, a YouTube video, a PDF, a JPEG, a, a Word document, you know, a PPT, whatever. You can put all this stuff on LinkedIn now and embed it. People have a pick, and that's where the future is going, right? Just like artists and, you know, I hire graphic designers, they come with a whole portfolio of their work. Well, the future of the HR professional, the IT professional, the marketing professional will be a portfolio of work as well online. And some people are more sophisticated, they build up websites and things, but LinkedIn has made it very, very easy to do that. But what are you going to say? You're going to say, you know, I, I, I you know, launched some like long, long time and attendance system, and it went fine, and it was compliant, and da 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 da, and, you know, 40% of people used it, and we had to bit people, and meet people, and pull their bonuses back, and you know. Like, I mean, is that your story? Is that really your career story? Because your career story about to be something really extraordinary, really interesting and sexy. You have something that would light you up at a cocktail party. When you're at all these receptions and things, and people ask what company you work for, or where you're from, or why are you here? You know, do you have a really flat line, or do you have something really interesting to say, you know, we really want to change how we're using workforce analytics to make data-driven decisions. We want to be very, very smart in what we do. And what we're doing is we're taking data from our CRM and our HRIS and our customer client satisfaction. We're pulling all of it together, and it's like we have like 3D vision into the future. Well, that's a pretty sexy story. Or you could say, you know, we're creating reports and charts, right? So, you know, you want to have a context for the work and what you're doing. And I promise you, not only your career, but think about your business sponsor. Who's your client with your, your own company? It might be your chief executive officer. It might be a line of business, a geography or division president, you know? It might be the CHRO, if you're, a, a, you know, head of COE or something like that. Think about making them successful. Think about them having bragging rights. Think about them having, within the company and outside, human capital wins that are interesting and evocative and, and having those be the things. I mean, rather than brag about the sales quota, you know, do they achieve it or not, or the market share growth, or the speed of the new product launch, what if they were bragging about your new 
training program. What if they're bragging about the campus? So, how many of you, by a show of hands, and this is like this is like the point you wake up instead of your sleep when you wake up. So, how many of you would say that your programs and initiatives are going too fast? Like you barely can keep up. Like they're going way too fast. We got like one hand, two hands, three, four, five. So they're going really, really fast. And how many of you would say that they're in a stall or going slow or a big slog or taking a lot of time? It's about equal number of hands. And so, you know, whether they're going fast or slow is going to really move the needle, not on just the metrics within your program, but on the impact that it's supposed to have on your firm. So I definitely think that most HR programs, and most corporate initiatives in general, and I saw research recently that 75% of uh, change initiatives in corporations fail. And, you know, it might be going okay for a period of time, but how long is it going to be going okay, we don't know. And so this is the sort of thing that I think when we think about making things much more sexy and much more interesting, they have greater staying power, they have greater buy-in, there's attractiveness. Rather than having all those people throw spears at it, right, you, you know what that's like, and you have that bullseye in your back as the change agent marching through the, the forest, you know, you all probably can relate to that and feel that having people jump on like groupies and have people follow you all the way through because it's a very cool place to be. So let's dimensionalize sexy. I love where he's dimensionalize and sexy in the same sentence. Um, so what are we talking about here? Well, I have a lot of examples of what something could be in terms of sexy, but I've really broken it down into four things because I like simple. I like to break it down. So number one is, is, is around values. So this is the hardest one. And this is, if you think about like operating principles or values as a place to come from, this is, is literally your mindset and where you and your organization think from when you construct an HR initiative or marketing initiative or an IT initiative. It's, 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 it's how you make decisions and it's how you view the world. And that's actually, this is the hardest one, but this is actually the total access to making something sexy is shifting your values. And being clear, maybe it's not even a shift, it's just an awareness and an agreement, right? You know, if you think about, I was, I was Lean Six Sigma Black Belt trained and, and a big thing in the charter, we'd always define before we ever start a project like a constitution, like a one pager. It's very clear about what we were trying to do, who was involved, what success looked like, when it was going to be done by, etc. So what if there were clarities on, the, on those values? I'll give you some examples. The next one is design. And this is, you know, design in the physical or aesthetic sense, you know, or the, the uh, physicality sense, if it's a physical design. But this is also process, flow, workflow, system, those sorts of things. So how is it designed or structured? We'll go through some examples on that as well. Third thing is how do you stimulate? How do you create that vibe, that buzz, that thing that gets things going, that gets things, you know, imagine being at a football game, right? You ever seen the wave get started and all of a sudden 80,000 people are doing this thing and it's like this weird, it's coming at you, right? You feel it coming and you almost like, you can't really opt out. You can, you know, there are a few people opt out, but you're like, Ugh, you know, and you get up and you put your coat up or you hold your beer or whatever you do. And the wave somehow happens and what is that about, you know, somehow out of nothing, 80,000 people are all looking on the field. And all of a sudden, everyone's in this like unison, and this is a dance. What happens? That stimulation. We talk about how you stimulate your, your initiative. And the last thing is around activate. So stimulate is that vibe, that, that buzz, that excitement. Activate is actually putting it in motion. That's the behavioral change, or something actually changes. Something actually does something. Stimulate, I'm jacked about it. Activate, I pull the trigger. Okay? And so this is, we're going to talk specifically about how do you move people, you know, how do you create that momentum and that inertia. And that's, these are the four dimensions we talk about sexy today that we're going to, that we're going to go through. So let's talk about values. So often how we do it now, and when I say we, I mean HR, management, companies, organizations, governments, nonprofits, just a collective we. I'm not saying you might do it differently, right? You're a leader, and I want to. You should be tweeting about that, blogging about that. You should be speaking at the next HR Tech conference. But if you're not, just lean into this. So values. So oftentimes, from a values perspective, we treat people and think of them, employees, like children, like crybabies, like people that need to be fed, and changed, and watched, and hopefully not shook, you know. And so you know, you, you think about this, and from a place. You kind of assume that they're going to misbehave. You need to cage them in, right? You think about a trying to accurate or nasty or things. Well, you know, fortunately, we had policies to deal with that, right? If you're a jerk on the phone or in person or at a meeting, we can fire you. Same thing on social media. And in fact, you know, we had those policies for the outliers, but we had to assume, you know, gosh, 99% of people at Marsh were professional, dedicated, hardworking people. And so we're 
really disempowering and defensive when something is set up that assumes almost bad intent, like you're going to be a jerk. You can imagine, you know, when someone comes to you in a personal relationship, then you can kind of feel that you already assume you're, you know, bad. That doesn't feel good, but if they hold you to higher standards, you know, Mary Kay Ash built Mary Kay companies, built, turned more females into millionaires than any other business person or company in the world, you know, talks about making people feel important, right, and, and praising people for success. And that's a, bit, that's a big difference. And if you think about values, the sexy way to do it is to assume you've got great employees, you got people that, in fact, it's like they just need a little polish, they just need to get rinsed off. You know, it's like you found this gem and it's like a rock that just needs a little polish and it's going to be beautiful, right? And then there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you know, it's like the, it's like a dry sponge, put a little water on it, it's going to soak it up. You've got a lot of dedicated commitment, committed people that are untapped. They're just waiting, they're late. I and mean, they're people that, in reality, their unused engagement is a huge opportunity. You don't need to hire more people. You need to hire for a labor problem. Getting throwing more crappy people at it just creates a big cluster. No, you need to engage the people that you have. So what I want you to do is for just a second, let me do a couple of other examples of values actually. So how we do it now that generally doesn't work is we think about stick, right? You know, our value is we're gonna force people or beat them, you know. And what works is carrot. Simply put, right? And having, you know, rewarding people and assuming good intent, and even if they're doing something you think left their job or they should be doing it, praise them, give them, reward them. Another thing is, you know, you think about um, uh, your employees. Do you think about them as grunts or like indentured servants or people to be, you know, kind of abused? Or do you think of them as customers? Because I can imagine no matter what business or industry you're in, there's a way that you treat your customers, there's a way that you interact with them. And there's a standard to be set. And a lot of companies treat their employees way worse than they treat their customers. It doesn't make any sense to me. In fact, a lot of folks, there's an employee's first customer, second was book came out a couple years ago. Um, and in thinking about that, and that's a big, that's a value sort of thing. Um, you know, another one, make it mandatory, required. Okay, when I say compliance training, everyone else like get like a little thing, you know? Or, you know, like pay your taxes, you know, some of those things. So, you know, making something mandatory, that's a very stick sort of thing. We're going to tie your bonus to it. We're going to tie this or you're not going to get your raise this year or da 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 or you can't go on the sales trip or whatever it is, right? What about if you just made it compelling rather than compulsory? What if, you know, somehow Facebook, you know, I, even people I know that work in social media full time, most of them in their free time, they're just not required to be on Facebook. It's something like 20, 25% of all internet traffic in the U.S on Facebook. Why? It's compelling. I mean, Instagram, I love Instagram. I'll get on Instagram and I will lose like 45 minutes of my life and I don't even know what happened. There's like a YOLO and a nom nom and a, you know, you know, selfies and all this stuff. And I'm just, I don't even know what's happening, but it's so compelling and sticky and fun, you know, being in this. And no one's ever required me to be on Instagram. It's like one of the, you know, the favorite things I do in engagement technology on a daily basis. So think about having your initiative rather than be mandatory. That just sets the bar really low for you and your organization, for your career and for everything. Think, oh, we're just going to force people to do it. We're going to force them to eat this slot. It's dog food, right? Now, what if it's compelling to think, like, we have to actually make it so good that people want to do it and that they're running to it like moths to a flame? So, what I want you to do is I want you to take about two minutes and find a partner next to you, okay? I want you to think of something you're working on now or will work on. Like, why did you come to this conference? Did you come here to learn about recruiting technologies or to buy something in the learning space? You're doing something with, with operations and shared services for payroll, lead management. What is it? Is there something around culture or engagement or collaboration? Think about what you came to achieve. And I want you to think for a second about values for that initiative. And think about your default position, maybe where you or your organization might be coming from and what a sexy position would be. So I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll tell you to switch about a minute in, but find someone. If you end up being by yourself, you know, don't check out. You know, write on a piece of paper and think about it. It's going to be very useful when you get out of this meeting today. Is there anyone that had anything really kind of juicy or insightful, or something that they think might be useful for other people in the room? Anyone want to share anything? You know, great this morning? Who wants to share? OK. So got one right here. All right. I'm going to bring you a microphone. Which means you're a leader. In terms of being social engagement, social learning technology, if I'm not creating meaning, I'm creating noise. Mm -hmm. So how do I eliminate that and get really focused? And what do you get out of the thing about values and thinking about values specifically? Um, it, it's to be true to them. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, and not to espouse them in anything else, not to be an early adopter of somebody else's values, but to be the adopter of my own. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Thanks, Limo. And I think, you know, when you think about values, we'll often think about what we say are values, or what the posters say, right? Something like the sexy stuff we did at Marsh. But really, the values of your company are how things get done. You know, how does it work around here? How are decisions made? What behavior is tolerated or not tolerated? What's incented or not? Who gets promoted? Who gets resources? Et That's where a lot of values, actually, where the rubber meets the road. It's one thing to say, you know, Enron had integrity as one of their values, you know, chiseled in marble in the lobby of their freaking building. Give me a break. Losers, you know. So, so next one. Design. Now, there's this weird thing about HR initiatives in particular where we think that they have to be available to everybody. Like all employees, you know. But you know, when you think about the New York Yankees or whatever sports lower and lower and lower and lamer and lower and lamer. It needs to be for everyone. And that's just not a very sexy way to design something. To have it be completely for every, you know, that it, every little thing is considered for every employee in every market, and every little thing, rather than saying, how can we create a really rad experience for a select group of people and shower them with resource or attention, et cetera. And so you can imagine you're standing in line for something that's like lame, you know, you could be at you know, the DMV or something like that. It's a great example of how we design HR initiatives, right? We make people wait in line a long time, there's a lot of grumpy people involved, there's a lot of paperwork, it's confusing, everyone gets the same treatment, it's not clear where to go. Sexy way. So when you go to the airport this afternoon, you know, you probably you see a lot of private aircraft here in Las Vegas, and you'll see first class cabin, right? So something about first class, they, they, they give you, you know, alcohol and food and greater seats and different, you hang up your coat and all these different things. And if you think about that as a metaphor for your HR initiative, you know, who are the colleagues in your firm that are worthy of a first class experience? And I don't mean everyone like you want to treat everyone with respect and dignity. That's great. I get that. I'm talking about above that extra. So who would be and how would you create an experience where people are blown away? The design and the, the thoroughness and the rigor and the consistency, the persistence, the kind of ever-changing nature of it, you know, is you know, private aircraft like this might seat eight people, right? This is not a this is not a you know an A380, right? This is meant to create, you know, you know, for a few folks that has, have disproportionate impact. And the challenge I would give you is don't confuse this with rank or level or role. Think about this as people that are worthy and deserve it because of their attitude, their skill, their behavior. Think about it from the perspective of meritocracy rather than traditional command and control hierarchy. So you want to really piss off millennials, get into that. You know, oh, you're not old enough. Or you're not a labor grade F. Or you're not this, or you're not that. They will lead, right? This is about, and you know, not all millennials are worth it or deserving of it. Just like we talk about the, the Yankees, a lot of them are, could be useless in your company. But find the ones that are great, because there are some fantastic ones, just like there are fantastic X's and there are fantastic boomers, and the same distribution goes for all generations. Find the best ones and plug them into these experiences and have it be something really transformative. I mean, you think about even just dollars and allocation, right? You think about that spread the peanut butter metaphor right on the toes and think about comp season, right? What you're trying to do with your merit increases. Think about what, what you could do if you didn't spread it. If you had a huge dollop or a lot of peanut butter, what would you do? How would you invest that? How would you have that kind of experience? You could do things for a select group of colleagues that would be really extraordinary. So again, turn to the person next to you when you think about design. Actually, I'll give you a couple examples first, and then you can turn. So design. Often how we do it now, ugly. Right? Think about even some of the products on the trade show floor. <laughs> you know, that you look at these systems and you think, gosh, when I go to Amazon or when I buy something on eBay or whatever else, it's, it's pretty elegant and attractive and whatever else or whatever what iTunes and things, but we somehow our enterprise systems and, and our initiatives and even the collateral and things that go out with it, they're ugly. They're just plain ugly. They're frumpy, right? That is not sexy, okay? Sexy is having something sleek or beautiful or elegant. Another thing around design is we sometimes make it very hard or complex. We'll design something that you know does a million things and all these different pathways, but that takes years to just blueprint it and create it and finally roll it out, you know? Well, again, back to the Instagram example, Instagram does very little. 
It's a very basic thing. It's like the simplest little piece of technology you've ever seen, but it does it really well. And sometimes, you know, Michelangelo said simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So think about that in your design. Um, we were talking about treating everyone the same, one size fits all. Um, you know, another thing in the design is it's like casting concrete. You know, it doesn't improve. You roll it out, you get that system out of that program, and that's just how it is. Well, things work or they don't work. When you think about great startups and things, they're iterating, they're learning, they're getting feedback. So are you investing attention and energy and resource and talent into not only sustaining programs, but continuously improving them based upon the feedback you're getting? That's a part of the design. Are we going to take a bet and try to get it right and roll it out to the whole world? Or are we constantly evolving and adapting it and having some flexibility and some life cycle in that? Um, another thing in the design, if you do it alone, that's a very common thing right now. We're like in this isolated thing. I sit in my cube, my gray, you know, carpet wall thing, and my Herman Miller chair, and I'm on my IBM Lenovo computer, and I do things alone, right? Or is it together? Is there things that you've done in a social way? Or you know if your team is doing them? You know, you think about when I was at Lockheed Martin, we had really fabulous ethics training, you know, ethics yeah. training. And then we, do, we do these like board games, these interactive things, some of the best training I've ever seen. When we get together and we do it together, rather than some module or something, we actually have real discussions. They bring in actors, they do all sorts of cool things with video and things. And it was really, really fabulous. That's part of the design. So take two minutes, again, turn to your partner next to you and think about design and your current initiative, what you're here for. Think about where your current paradigm might be, where, sec where, where sexy design can be. Take two minutes. So the next thing we'll think about, so we first had values, right? So what are, what are our values? How do we think about this and from our core being and beliefs, right? Our operating principles on this. And the next thing we had is design, right? How do we construct this? How do we architect this? You know, what's the experience going to be? And really being thoughtful. And you think about um, even, you know, those of you that are Apple customers and seen the new iOS 7, there's a few bugs and they're working things out, but they actually in the design looked at solving some real problems. You know, my mom was here this weekend and, and we took all these photos. We went on a helicopter ride into the Grand Canyon. And, uh, and we, all, we had all these photos of both of our phones. And we usually would like freaking email them to each other and then download them in these folders. And I'm like, now there's this airdrop thing on the Bluetooth and you can sit next to someone and just zing them a bunch of photos and videos and it's really, really slick. Or the fact that you can just, you know, you think about being in a meeting or on the airplane, you just flip up at the bottom of your thumb and you can go right to airplane mode versus digging around with the flight attendants barking at you, right? You think about those sort of things and that's being thoughtful, right? That's having customer intimacy, creating a better experience and having empathy for what people go, with, go through, right? Having products like that. Next thing is stimulation. How do we create a buzz? How do we create excitement? So they click on the link, right? This is very simple, common software. There's Exact Target and the MailChimps and the Constant Contacts and all these different companies that do that. But yet we don't apply that principle that we'll have in the marketing department externally, internally. So a good open rate, a good one, for internal email, any guesses? 15, 20, 7, it's 20. 20 is about average for a benchmark. So, you know, 20 means that four, if you're not a math person, four out of five people did not open your email. So sending out a, an email saying, hey, we got this great new HR thing, right? That means four out of five people didn't get the email. And click rates are oftentimes one, two, three, four, five percent, kind of down in that range. So even of the 20 that opened it, only a small fraction might actually be going to your site. And any of you that have done external or email marketing, probably know that very robustly, and that's a game you're always optimizing and playing with the effectiveness of those things. I'm not saying don't use email. Email should be a part of the solution, and you should use HTML-enabled emails that are beautiful and visual and have the analytics in them and those sorts of things, and create selected lists you can do targeted things or translate things. Make it effective, right? We start translating things in 12 languages, our, our internal comms group, uh, until, I, until I ran it, never done that. It was always English only, yet we operated in 100 countries. We started translating and people were like, oh, I actually can understand it. I'm in Japan. I'm in Germany. This makes sense. You know, I'm in, I'm in Brazil. And it was like, well, of course, you know, we expect everyone to buy into this thing in a language they might not be as proficient at or even have any competency like a lot of our colleagues in some parts of China. And so sending out an email is just lame. It's the flattest, easiest way. You know, email is 40 years old. Which is 
long in the tooth, okay? And so, and I'm hoping she's going to kick the can one of these days because I'm just not a fan in general. But, you know, it's a thing, and especially with newer gen younger generations, they struggle to use it. But, you know, I don't know about you all, but I get so much email. And, you know, Gmail, if you're a Gmail customer, they did something brilliant recently, right? They created these, like, tabs and they auto-filter. So it's like the only thing that's ever improved my email in, like, 10 years is now at least some of the more important ones are under this tab that's, that, you know, they show up and I can see what happens. Um, but, you know, so it's, this is not a way to create a lot of a, a buzz, a vibe, and an excitement is to send out an email. Or you can put a poster in the break room. And then, you know, you can do posters, too make them really cool and have them stand out. Probably don't put them in the break rooms. You know, put them in stands by the elevator banks when people are waiting, you know? Or get decals and put them on the elevator doors. And that's what, that's what, you know, company, you know, think about what, what's Las Vegas do, right? Look at all the brilliant marketing to engage people and their customers here. What does work? So any of you are Lululemon customers or fans? All right, so Lulu is a very cool company. I have a bunch of their product and work out, and it's kind of like the it workout clothes in New York right now, so I had to have some, you know. But what I found is it's really well constructed and really thoughtful design, very cool materials. But when you go to the stores, it's a really fantastic experience. And I met someone in their leadership development group, and you know, when they launch a new store, you know, you imagine those of you that are in retail and businesses, when you open a new store, you have like a ribbon cutting, and someone from corporate comes out in a suit, and then the new employees have their fresh, crisp uniforms, and they're like, yay, we're open. You know, like, and so like that's typically a store opening, right? Not all that exciting. Well, Lulu has a budget. Every time they have a store opening, and they do it differently in every market, there is no template other than create a buzz, have a big bang. So they'll do these things so they can fill a whole street full of people doing yoga, right? They'll close a the street and they'll do some big thing and they'll do all sorts of really fun sort of things that is like really catches people off guard. They don't necessarily have to cost a lot of money either. Don't confuse this. With stimulation means throw you know you know a bunch of money at it. But they do something that's really, really, really different. You know, I can tell you at March we did a uh, we had a birthday party for our social network. So the social network like it turned one, and we sent out all these birthday things. We got cakes, and we went to the cafeteria, and we had huge cakes that we cut. And I can't even tell you in my you know five and a half years there when we ever had cake in the cafeteria ever, and for free, you know. And we had people cutting cakes and wishing happy birthday and handing out water bottles and this and that. But it created this buzz and this excitement. And then we also had a whole bunch of banks and computers for people to get set up with profiles or to ask questions, our community managers there, etc. And it created a whole bunch of excitement. Probably the one of the better examples, a lot of times in benefits enrollment, annual enrollment, sometimes you do some fairs and you create some buzz. That can be a place to look from if you do that really well, of ways to create some stimulation. You know, another thing about Lulu that's very cool is they actually do something called Beyond Luon. And what they did is they sourced talent to have a TED-like conference. And they do these in different parts of, of the country. They're in Chicago, they're in Toronto, and I think Vancouver. And they actually have their own employees. Often they were just retail employees, right? And they have them give talks about their life and what they're up to outside of their job, what they've experienced they've overcome, a nonprofit that they're involved in, an experience that they've had. And they have these like, oh great, so there's stuff on YouTube and there's stuff in the media about it. And it's all internally sourced, but it's an external event. So, it's, so they show it internally and they promote it significantly, but it's on their blogs. We'll talk about, I mean, think about all the recruiting technology you saw. You know, and like the big innovation now is like, we have someone in their cube going, I love filing TPS reports with this insurance company, right? You know, like, you know, that's, you know, is that a really sexy way to say, come work here? Or is it to show the Beyond Luan conference employees, and you're seeing people that they might even just work at a cash register, get this really interesting person that's been up to something or experienced something. There's a magnet, and there's a respect from Lulu to think you are more than just a clerk, or do you have a launch? You know, when the when the new iPad came out for the first time, all around San Francisco at the convention center where they do the announcement, all the outdoor advertising, like Clear Channel and CBS and those folks do that is on, you know, the, the bus uh, shelters and the benches and billboards, trash cans, telephone booths, all of that in a two hour period while all the media and analysts were in the building was all changed to all iPad when they got out. So you walked out for blocks and it was all like, like the world had completely changed, right? In a two hour period, highly orchestrated, they worked with a lot of their partners, they weren't Apple employees doing that, but that was with their partners. And they were, that created a great sense of stimulation, like the world, like, talk about sex, right? You might have only paid for that advertising space for a week, but there was something that was really cool about that. You know, another way to stimulate, you know, think about endorsements. So, you think about, you know, you see whether it's a diet program on TV or a company, well, all of the holdouts, 
right? The old timers that typically are kind of going to cross their arms might say, well, Bob said it's okay, so I'm going to get on this, right? You create the permission for people. But what if you have some of your highest performing employees, people in the president's circle in your sales organization, you know, people that are in the, the high potential leadership programs, people that are very visible, what if they were saying, I love this program and I'm using this program, and they were promoting it to others? You know, a crappy brand, that's how we often do it now. We're like, we're rolling out the new talent assessment tool, T-A-T. <laughs> if I was a marketing executive, you'd fire me, right? So what if you had something, you know, that's like, it's, we're calling it talent zen, and it's like all about getting your zen. You did something very cool or interesting, at least that had people interested enough to check it out. It doesn't often be utilitarian and always be very literal, but it's, it'd be explained. But you create, you, you peak them, right? You can't you, you peak, and you pass them into the initiative to have them experience that. Um, you know, plus, be transparent, but in phases. Because that creates curiosity. You know, we did it with, with, with in you, our social network, we did it in all these phases, and it was a little bit at once. And we do releases every Thursday, we do kind of a mega release every like two months or so, and there'd be like a new thing or a new feature. And we wouldn't say tell everyone what was coming, right? It was something to just turn out and test it, but it was exciting for people, and that was a big thing. Um, you know, and the other thing is about thinking about external. So I saw um, Shelly Lazarus, I think her name is, and she was the Ogilvy chairwoman and she broke the glass ceiling in advertising. And I saw her speak about a year ago. Then she talked about really world-class advertising campaigns um, actually invest a little bit for employees. They actually think about the external advertising as a source to motivate the employee internally, that there's more belief when it actually is communicated outside. And they see that. So she talked about IBM's Smarter Planet campaign that Ogilvy did, which has been a brilliant and very big success. And that that actually, the best outcome of that campaign is it taught IBM employees that IBM was back it got them excited and believing in IBM again. And so when you think about, you know, you know, typically you have everything is like, well, you know, I'm the division president of the CHO, so trust me, and this is the initiative we're gonna do, versus saying, hey, we won all these awards, we're featured in this media, you know, we're we're certified in this, or we've been endorsed by that, or working with this sort of consortium. You know, having those proof points, issue press releases. I mean, we had our new site, we had a whole external website for the rest of the world to see what it looked like. We had our videos and collateral and animations and you know, some speeches we given at conferences. And so it proved people could show their their spouse or their friend or whatever wanted to know about it, say, we'll take a peek at it, right? They almost became salespeople for this internal thing, and people were getting very excited about it. So that's a way to stimulate. So again, turn to the person next to you and take two minutes and talk about with your initiative what you think you hide the shift from kind of boring. <laughs> Values, number two, design, number three, stimulate, number four, activate. So you've been thoughtful in your principles about how this is and in, in, in where you're coming from and how you make your decisions. You've created something elegant and useful and, and thoughtful, and then you've created some buzz or some hype, but now it's go time. So what do you do? Activation. Well, how do we activate now? Well, we typically make people, it's like, yeah, sign up for the new TAP. I mean, I don't know, I made this thing up, TAP, but we're gonna go with it. So we sign up for the new TAP program, you know, and fax in this thing, and then you can wait, and we'll send you a postcard with your credentials, and then once your manager approves it, you can log on, and then we'll have the moderator carrying all these boxes. You know, we, you know, gosh, if you start a new initiative and you're like, hey, get your new username and password. People need an, another username and password like they need a bullet in the head, right? How many of you have you that little list, right? You're not supposed to have. Try to hide it somewhere in your phone. And you're like, so, you know, you know, you need to be using SSO, right? If you're going to launch a new technology product from your network, so employees don't have to log in. Or log in, log in with Facebook or LinkedIn Connect or one of these products where people can use it an existing credential set and make it easy, right? So right now we make it very hard. We make, you know, you have to, you know, use the sign up wizard. It's only, you know, 17,000 questions, you know? And you go to sign up and it asks you your name and your email address, but you sent me an email about it, you already know mine? Like, why don't you pre-populate that with your HRIS data? Don't ask me questions that you already know the answer to. That is annoying. I would, if I was a customer, I wouldn't. You know, every time I go back to Amazon, they're not like, hey, who are you, right? They're, like, they're just like, you wanna go? You wanna walk like this? Mm -hmm. So like, they're ready to go and make it super, super easy. So a way to activate, you wanna think about white gloves or a service. You wanna think about really treating your employees with a lot of respect and care. And you might be thinking it's gonna cost a lot, I promise you it doesn't. We use WordPress for our blogging platform as part of a larger social network. 
Not a single colleague ever uploaded a blog into WordPress. Yet we had hundreds, if not thousands of colleagues to blog. You know what they did? They emailed them to my team of a couple of people who uploaded them for them. Do I want a managing director who's making, you know, three quarters of a million dollars a year who's an expert in risk management figuring out the back end of the current instance we have of WordPress? No. For them to blog twice a month? Forget about it. What I want them to do is write the blog on their Blackberry or their email or Word, something that they've used for a long time and they know how to use, and then email it to my team. If you want to do video, we'll send someone to your office to record you. I don't want you on, you know, fussing around an iMovie and your assistant is going through 15 rounds of this or whatever. No, we made it very, very, very easy to do that. You, know, you get a comment. We have people, you know, comment on the blogs. So oh, I'm on the road. I can't log in. We did reply by email commenting. Right? Just like any sort of civilized technology product with this debt, right? We made it very easy to do the behaviors you want. Do you make your employees go through a jungle or jump through lots of hoops to have the behavior that you want? Think about what you want them to do and what's between what you want them to do and where they stand. You want to remove all of those barriers that you can. If it's sign-in, if it's confusion around the system, or I need training, or there's an approval, or there's a form, or there's this, or there's that. Activation is really about getting people going and getting people moving and having that behavior happen right now. So other examples of activation. So again, you know, do it yourself versus, versus a white glove. Um, do you bury it? You say, hey, check out the new TAP program. Go to the intranet and then log into your people portal and then get into the LMS and under the talent tab, go into North America and then click night shift and then find it in a folder called don't look at this null. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Versus do you say, come right in, sir. Think about a red carpet. People can walk right in. It's easy. It's right there. It's available. You know, when you walked into the Bill Cutic reception last night, did you have to look for a glass of champagne? No, they handed it to you right when you walked in. You was ready to go. It was a party. They thought of your needs in advance. That's how you activate. That's how you got that party started. What about having it be all online, you know? If you want to create buzz, do you have it all trapped in a monitor or a system? No, your hallway should say something. If you've got a big lobby, you have a big banner. If you've got TVs in your, in your hallways or in your elevators, use them, you know? Brand the space, have people wear lapel pins or put things on their name badges or have people have, you know, t-shirts or swag. People, like swag is like crap. People are addicted to swag. I saw people in the trade, they, it's like, you don't have to give people bonuses, just give them swag. They love it. Have it be good swag. They do, do iPad cases with like Bluetooth keyboards, like good swag, right? You know, don't do crappy swag, but good swag. You know, um, you know, in, you know, activate. You know, do you have it be this, you know, run from the corporate center, home office, or do you have field agents? Do you have ambassadors or community managers that are fanning the flames, right? It's one thing to, to light the fire, it's another to keep it burning. So do you have people out there that understand how things work in Paris or in Sao Paulo? or in Singapore, or in St. Louis, and they can help you translate in that environment, problem solve, and get people excited and encouraged. You know, is it predictable? Do you know kind of exactly what you're getting when you go in? That's boring, that's not sexy. Or are you delighted, are there surprises? You know, we sent you know, blogger appreciation, lots of people blog, we never said there'd be a reward or anything, we sent the big boxes of gifts after like a year. They didn't even know, they just came. They were blown away. But people that are doing what you want them to do, delight them, surprise them. Think about your best customer. You know, Zappos does this with people. They'll send them flowers and do all these other sorts of things. You know, they stimulate because they do those sorts of things. So this one we're not going to be prepared to share because of time. But think about this as you leave today about what you can do from activation. How you can get people off their chairs or to, you know off their mouse to do what you want them to do. You have got the right values. You have got the right design. You have created the right buzz. Now it's go time. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about barriers and about excuses. So probably, if you're like a lot of people that attend conferences, you know, you go and you take notes and you're really excited and interested, and then you get to your office tomorrow, and it's like a real reality check. It's like coming back after Labor Day weekend, right? And so all the hope and promise and the excitement that you had, you're completely resigned and totally in despair, and like, you're going to need a few beers on Friday night. Well, you know, I want you to really think about leadership and about action. And there was a guy, I saw a YouTube video earlier this year by a guy named Art Williams. And he started a company, A.L. Williams, in the 70s and then in the 80s. And there was a life insurance company that would hold uh, uh, to term life and created a, uh, a billion dollar company. They, they wrote more life insurance than Prudential and New York Life combined. This guy was a football coach from Georgia. And a relatively simple guy. 
and he's got a great YouTube talk, and I value your business card, so I'll send you some notes and some things, and this talk and everything about that as well. But he talks a lot about leadership and about action. I think it's perfect to talk from activation to action. How do you activate you as a leader? And, and I don't mean a leader like what your company hierarchy says or what's in your business card. Like a leader like anyone can be a leader from wherever you stand in whatever you do, right? So don't confuse authority or management. They're completely distinct. Well, here's what I, 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 I've met a lot of people this week. I talked to a lot of people. And I'm online with a lot of different folks. And I, get, I hear lots of excuses about why things can't be done. You know, Henry Ford said, well, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And look, so you can be committed to this. And the, the, the change, I mean, the social learning panel yesterday, only 50% of social media initiatives are coming from the top down. A lot of them are very emergent from leaders all over the hierarchy. And so when you think about taking, you know, actually, here's the excuses that you're going to get. And here's, and Art Williams has this great speech, much better than I do. But, um, but you know, people say to me, well, Ben, you know, it's comp season. I'm, 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 I'm booked until February. You know, I'm like, well, come on. You're going to wait till you're going to wait your entire company. You're going to put behind so you can figure out how to give two percent raises, right? So I say, just do it. You know, the difference between people that have the results, that career slide, that are the woman at the podium, the people that have the accomplishments, the sexy story, and the narrative, they get over their list of excuses. They get over their crap. They get over the barriers that are in their own head to achieving these things. So you might say, well, Ben, you know, I don't know how to. Who cares? Just do it. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff either. I made it up. I've never done animation until I did it. I never did social media until I did it. I don't even know if I've ever been qualified for any job that I've ever had until I did it, right? That's that catch-22, right? You have 25 years of sales experience to have that sales role. How do you get 25 years of sales experience if you weren't sales? You know, this is a weird thing. People will say, well, gosh, that my management, they just don't get it. Not this culture, my management. Who cares? Get them to get it. Just do it. They'll like it. No one at Marsh wanted this. No one cared for it. No one said, gosh, man, can you make this sexy, sizzle, hot thing that's colorful and cool and dances and chirps and plays Beyonce? No, no one asked for that. But we did it anyway. And then they loved it, you know? They'll say, well, Ben, you know, gosh, my marketing team sucks. They can never, who cares? Get on Elance. Go to Fiverr. Buy something online. Use third parties. You know, don't get held hostage by them. You know, Ben, you know, we've got the worst IT department. We've got the crappiest, we're like a, we're on office in 1977, you know? <laughs> Who cares? Move anyway, get off a of DOS, whatever. Make it, do it, do it, a hard copy, you know? You know, Ben, I don't have the budget. Well, hell, I didn't have the budget either, but find the money. Look, if you're doing something compelling, you can actually deliver, that sets you apart from about 99% of people you work with. Most people you work with can't get crap done. They just eat resources, nothing happens. They want to hire more people so they can invest in inefficiency and produce worse outcomes. No way, you're going to produce something new. You get the money, you're going to do something. Put your butt on the line. Well, Ben, you know, I don't even know where to start. Start anywhere, you know? The secret of getting ahead is getting started. Well, Ben, you know, I don't, I don't even have the training. You know, I don't, I don't even know what to do. Well, go, go get, get the training. You, you've ever heard of the interweb? It's like the best learning management system in the world, okay? You just have to do a little searching. You know, well, Ben, I gotta finish my MBA first. No, you don't. Well, Ben, you know, I just, I, you know, we just had a merger. Do we have to do it? You definitely have to do it if you just had a merger. Well, Ben, we just laid off people and got through the, you know, the rifts and all this, the financial crisis. Do we have to be sexy? Yes, do it. Well, Ben, you know, legal says I can't. Well, screw legal. You sign up for the risk. <laughs> Did you know lawyers, with the exception of indemnity and a few other select things, actually don't have decision-making authority at most companies? They are supposed to advise you. And I've got a lot of lawyers and friends, and they've been great partners. I was on a legal services nonprofit. I have a lot of respect for the profession of law and people with law degrees and what it does. But let me tell you, lawyers are there to be very smart and thoughtful advisors, so you are eyes wide open about what you're doing. But when you have faced something and they say this is a risk, there's nothing wrong with risk. Everyone that's rich has taken some risk, right? Everyone that's successful has. It's the risk-reward ratio. And there's typically processes to your company to sign a risk register and to say the business leader will say, I understand and accept this risk. Here's how we're going to mitigate it, but it is worth going for it. Don't let that get in the way. Screw them. You know, Ben, they say, you know, I don't even know who would help me. Well, I'll help you. Everyone in this room will help you. Get on the HR Tech LinkedIn group. There's like 8 million people, you know. Come to more conferences. Get on Twitter chats. Do all these sorts of things. If you're in some, you know, I don't know, electric company in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and you're the head of HR, get on the web. There's a whole world of people out there that can help you. So the people that do it, they just do it. And they come up with an excuse and they get over it. The entrepreneurs I work with and the startups and the companies that are doing great things, what differentiates them from the big corporations is they don't have blame storms. They don't have excuse sessions. 
They, they run into something and they're like, well, how do I figure it out? And they email a friend or they make it happen or they do a Google search or they brute force it or whatever it takes. But they have this can-do tenaciousness about them. And you'll run into the same things. I had to learn all about data privacy in France and Germany. You know, but I had to figure it out. And we learned it, right? I had to learn all about servers. You know, finally we didn't have servers. I went and bought some on my corporate card. You know, went a little rogue, but we had it done, right? And so, you know, those are the things that that is going to produce the result is when you step up. And big change does not happen at companies from people that are patient or people that follow all the dysfunctional rules and have the, you know, follow the weird values and the poor design of how your company works. They're people that are committed for themselves and their career and for the organization to make something amazing happen, to create a miracle and to really step out. And they eventually accomplish something that they're proud of. So I want to think of, have you think about it as a leader. When you leave and get on the plane today, what would make you proud of yourself? What would move you in your career such that you're really proud at that deep level that you give yourself goosebumps when you thought about what you did? Think about that. Enough about excuses. Let's do a book drawing. And then we'll get to Q&A real quick. We've got a lot of cards. So we're the RuPaul one or the Career Warfare one. Okay. The next one we've got is, let's see. Jamie Rubin. Come on up, Jamie. Service Master, Bradford Crandell. Bradford, are you here? All right. All right. Career Warfare. Now, we're, okay, we're balancing it out. Oh, you want RuPaul? Okay, she's like, woo! Come on, RuPaul. She about, lost her wig. Okay. Oh, RuPaul. Oh, there we go. We got a leader right here, RuPaul. All right. Next person, Ceci Rosendahl from Starbucks. I want some Viva or something, you know, so. All right, and then the last person, uh, Karen Frank from Sask Central. Karen, you here? All right, Karen. By the way, I read a book, I'm halfway through it by Stephen Prescott. I wrote a other thing called Turning Pro. Has anyone ever read that book? Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, oh, I like, freaked out reading this thing. It's only like 50 pages, but it's great. So if you're looking for another good book, that's one that I heard it come up in conversation three times in a week, so that's a sign I should buy it. So Turning Pro is another great one. Okay, well remember, you walk out of here, sexy accelerates your career, sexy makes the initiative better, dimensions are sexier, values, design, activate, stimulate. And when you come up against any of those excuses or barriers or whatever, you want to karate chop that thing and get right through that, whatever it might be. Because there's always a solution. And there's a quote I saw the other day, you know, everything you want is on the other side of fear. So a lot of these excuses can be fear as well. But let me give you my contact information and thank you for coming and have safe travels. And thanks for coming to HR Tech.